Good evening, everybody. Uh, let's just open with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for everything today. We thank you for this blessed day, for your blessings upon our life. Just keep your hand steady upon us, Lord, as we seek your face. Teach us by your spirit and bring calmness to our spirit so we can receive what you have for us. We just thank you for your many blessings and we just praise you for the great message in your word, that great love letter to each of us. And we just say this in your name. Amen. The name of my message is Death Comes First. We really don't want to hear that, but it does. Death Comes First. Uh, let's look at Romans 6, 3. Know you not that so many of us as we were baptized in Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. We're baptized into his death. Uh, I hope you, you know, or I hope you're realizing how by grace God placed you in Christ. And that the life of Christ has been placed in you. And that you have to choose to believe this is so. In essence, you have to receive it in your heart. It's not enough to just have an intellectual understanding. Yes, I know that. You have to receive it as being so in your heart. Uh, the, they say that the largest space is between the mind and the heart, 18 inches. And what stands in between the 18 inches a lot of times is something called pride. And the only thing that bridges that heart to mind, or mind to heart or whatever, is something called humility and understanding your need for salvation and that everything is a matter of God's grace. Now, the problem we often have in Christianity, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not putting down uh, the churches today. I'm not doing that. If you go through history, the, the th things that churches are suffering from today They've suffered from through 200, 2,000 years. And whether it's the scribes or the preachers or the lawyers or the, uh, the people with all their theology, it's always been the same. The debates, the school of thoughts, the doctrines, uh, people separating, segregating according to religious affiliation, and uh, leaders and all the other things. It's always been that way. It's not that the church of today is any worse than the church of yesterday. The difference is that for every generation, it's been this push to bring all these religious um, churches or beliefs into a one system. It's called the ecumenical system. And, and we're seeing that. And the reason they're being able to do that is they have the tool, and that tool is called the United Nations. It's been a big, a big part behind all of that because they have their little groups coming out here, getting this liberal group together and calling themselves Christians or whatever, and they start promoting these ideas. And of course, you get the liberalism in, you get all these higher criticism in, you get all this other stuff. If you study the um, history of the church, that's what's happened. It's called higher criticism, and then it's advanced up to what we see today. Complete unbelief towards the Word of God as being infallible. So everything digresses. Whenever a man's involved in things, it digresses. And then you have to have God step on the scene to do some things. And he's done it through the years. He's done it through revivals. He's done it through people like uh, Wesley's, you know, John Wesley and his brother and all that. He's done it through people like that. And, and it's to bring the church back to center. And the problem is that even when he uses people to bring uh, the church back to center, they get their own little creeds. They get their own little ideas. 
and they start promoting that. And the problem is that it may be good, but eventually uh, man will start uh, taking it to the extremes. And that's where you see man going always to the extremes with these different things and creating a problem. And so nothing's different except that we are moving towards that ecumenical movement where the church will be a one world church system. Uh, today we were listening to uh, the fact that there's been many arrests made. Now I only mention this because they tell you to look for a couple of things to know an arrest is about has been made. One is that the person steps down from their position. You know right there they're doing it to preserve what dignity they have because they're already rested. We have learned, we've heard a lot of people stepping down. And in that group that's been arrested was religious leaders. And I thought, Jeanette, I asked her, I said, Jeanette, who has stepped down in the religious realm that we know? There's been a couple. And you think, are, have they stepped down because they're arrested because we heard that there were uh, misappropriation of funds during COVID-19 they used it for the wrong reason and they benefited their families and so this is something that has always been uh, very interesting to me because man will digress and he will digress and he will digress and the problem is that you can Put all the religious stuff on it, but if you're digressing away from the truth, the gospel, the mission, the commission, then you go, you, you, you're, you're going to just assume that the church is going to lose their vision. The church is going to lose their way. And it's going to have to be certain people coming out and saying, wait a minute, what does the Bible say? And there are other people saying, wait a minute, what does the Bible say? And so you have to always come back to center. And that's true today. And it's an individual thing. Yes, it's nice to have some great leader. But, excuse me, but it's going to be an individual thing. Really. Because the church will probably have to go underground. The true church will probably have to go underground. And in a way, many, much of it is going underground. If you know anything about the uh, movements of churches and, and Christians is they're beginning to become more disillusioned with what they're hearing and what they're seeing and they're looking elsewhere and they're looking to more personal groups or, and they're ba basically already being prepared to go underground in America. So the problem is that we have had and I've had this happen to me platitudes thrown at me about grace about mercy, about so many things. They're just platitudes. And there's little bits of truth of how it's supposed to work, right? Oh, well, this is how this works. And yet, there is no real teaching. And these little bits we get make us feel excited. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then the problem is it leaves us empty because there's no substance, there's no real teaching behind it. And we get excited, but our faith remains weak and waning. Because that is where this real substance comes from, is that faith walk. Not what you know, but walking in what is true. And they don't talk about what it means to walk in it, to walk it out. The Bible describes it, but we don't necessarily teach on it the way we should. Now... The truth is, in so many ways, we have been given crumbs under the table. Well, there are those motivation speakers, those cheerleaders that are saying and trying to convince us we have been offered the full loaf of truth at the table of fellowship. And the truth is, we're not even sitting up at the table of fellowship. We only know what fellowship is half the time. It's a true agreement in the spirit. People, if you don't have agreement in the spirit, you can't have fellowship. If you don't have agreement with God, you can't have fellowship. If you don't have the same spirit, the same mind, you can't have fellowship. 
Now, you may not agree doctrinally on things, but as long as you have the same spirit, the same heart, the same mind, you can have fellowship. And so that's the big key. Now, we've been given a generic explanation of our faith in Christ but not a clear presentation of it in light of true discipleship. We have been given this generic presentation, but it's never in light of true discipleship of what it means to truly follow Jesus. It's going to cost you something. You're going to have to be willing to lose some things along the way. They're not good things that you're going to lose along the way. They're really things that are going to hinder you. But we want to hold on to them instead of lose them and that jesus is going to always people please hear me whatever is important to you more important than loving him following him he's going to put his finger on it he's going to put his finger on it just like he did the rich young man that came to him he put his finger on what was going on with him now we have in in today's presentation we have been given things that are sweet but it keeps us from developing teeth to chew, assimilate, and walk out the Christian life. We don't chew, we don't assimilate, and we don't walk it out. So many Christians are still on milk, or trying to milk toast, whatever you want to call it. But they're on milk, pavlum, whatever you want to call it. And they're, not, they're never developing the teeth to chew into the Word of God so that they can assimilate the truth of God into their lives and walk it out. And so they remain in this sort of diaper state. And when you go to challenge them, they're like, Oh, that's just too tough for me. And you know what you want to do? You want to get in their face and say, Grow up! Get out of your baby diapers. When you can't come to Christ, he intends you to grow up. He doesn't intend the whole world to carry you across the finish line. It's up to you to learn to run the race. And you just want to get in their face and shake them and say, what is wrong with you? Where do you read that in Scripture? That someone's going to have to pick you up and, and can't tenderly carry you across the finish line because you're such a tender soul. No, you're an immature little boob. Grow up. Grow up. Now, it just... <laughs> this is my experience, okay? I have met a lot, I've met people that want to grow up, and they're wonderful people to be around. I mean, it doesn't matter how they don't know, but they want to know. They get in there, and they really want to know. And they stick to it. Because some of the things are hard. But then you get these, oh, that's, that's too much for me. I'm just too tender. I'm just, I'm like, really? Go, go back to whatever. Because, you know, those people are just going to get angry at you if you try to make them grow up. And they're not ready to. So, we want things sweet. We want somebody else to run the race for us and carry us across the finish line. And then we will say, oh, look at what I did. Yeah, you did nothing. When we were in uh, Nampa, Jeanette was given a vision. And when she told it to me, I just sat there shaking my head. And she had a vision of us all in a rowboat. And she said, Rayola, the only people that were rolling were women. And God was mad at the men because they were sitting there letting them. And you know what happened? We closed up the fellowship. We're all supposed to be in the race. We're all supposed to be rolling the boat. Okay, and, and we need, we're, we're body, we're one body, and we need to have that vision. But there's people, oh, well, I'm going to let so-and-so roll the boat. Well, are you a king or some kind of person that has a, 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 a chit from, well, well, that's what we call it, 
from your commander in chief that you don't have to do anything? My Bible doesn't say that. So the question is, unless we walk in faith, and the, the answer is unless we walk in faith, assurance, obedience to the word, we never are able to walk in freedom and victory. Please hear me. Uh, do I blame the religious leaders? Well, many, many sadly have replaced the truth with man's doctrines, dead letter doctrines. That's a sad reality. The Bible talks about that. And there's others that have been indoctrinated by a deadly mush of heresy mixed with a little bit of truth. And it's poison all the way through. As a result, these people have been robbed of true discernment. Their calling is on life supports at best. And they are void of heavenly vision that not only aspires but ensures anointing, that power and authority of heaven. We don't see it behind a lot of pulpits today. Now, I haven't been to every church. I can't say that, from, but from what I'm hearing, from what I'm seeing the church and people who are Christians and their cries, I read all these different uh, you know, newsletters from these different ministries, and I hear the same thing. Where can I go to find a good church? Where can I go to find good fellowship? Where can I go? I mean, it is a continual flow of that question. And so I have to assume something's really bad going on in churches because of the leadership. So at the truth is, as a minister, I have to take responsibility for what I know, okay? Maintain the integrity in my own calling and guard my testimony. That's what I have to do. I cannot let others define my life in Christ. That's up to you. That's up to you to let the Holy Spirit define your life in Christ, not anybody else. Now, I must not love this present life. That's the key. You can't love this present life. Uh, you can't care about your reputation. You can't care about this. The one thing you've got to make sure of is that what you know is true and what you do is right. It's honorable and it's just and it's in line with the Word of God. Now, I must value the one who is eternal, who has provided the abundant life for me. The one who enriches my life. His name is Jesus. He's the one I must seek. He's the one I must serve in the end. He's the one I have to please. I don't have to please Joe Blow over here. If Joe Blow's having a fit over something about me, Unless they can scripturally prove it to me, they need to go shut up and sit down or leave. Because I cannot respond to anything but what the Holy Spirit shows me, what scripture tells me. Because I'm here to tell you, being in ministry, you can have hundreds of people have a complaint against you. Hundreds of them. You don't preach right. You don't look right. You don't have the right message. Your message makes me uncomfortable. Your message is whatever. If I went by what everybody said, I'd be in an insane asylum. You cannot let people tell you what's going on. You have to let the Holy Spirit show you. And if God has a problem, I can guarantee you, if God has a problem with you in any way, he'll put the finger on you. And when he does, it's because he's going to take care of the problem. You can't anyway. And so that's something I've had to learn a long time ago because I've had enough people around me to always have some kind of criticism. And one thing that you try to do with people, this is something, is that you try to make sure that when people come into your midst, they're not carrying a bucket of rocks. And then I realize that maybe they're not carrying a bucket of rocks, but they just sure go out and find them. So it's just something you have 
to realize about people. Uh, we're fickle. Uh, what can you say? Now, I can't leave my spiritual life to anybody else but myself. I can't leave it to religious organizations. I can't leave it up to uh, the local church leadership or to tyrants who have no heart for the sheep. So I want you to realize something. Initially, the apostles turned the upside-down world right side up. But guess what's happened? Sadly, because of the influence of the world in the organized church, it has once again turned it upside down. We have to realize it's upside down. And we have to come into a place where God makes sure it's right side up and that we are in line with him. Now, it's hard in the type of environment we are to get our spiritual bearings. We are in Christ. He's in us. And we're enclosed by his complete work of redemption. We are enclosed by his complete work of redemption. But I need to state to you, that that doesn't mean we have the full revelation of it yet. We do not have the full revelation of redemption because that is not going to be realized until you get your new body. But we've had a complete work of redemption done for us on the cross. And when Christ comes and gets his body and however that works, we're going to have it be raised up in a new glorified body. That is the complete revelation of redemption. That's the whole purpose of it. You're going to be in a new glorified body. Oh, praise God for that. I mean, if I thought I had to go to heaven with this body, I would be depressed. Now, one's life is being immersed in and consumed by his life, the life of Christ. Now, Christ is our place, points to his work of redemption, and his life in us points to the walk. The faith walk. It has to be walked out. The work in us is passive. Because why? We didn't do a thing. We didn't do a thing. But the walk is active. Faith is an advancement in your life in Christ. God did and he continues to do the work. But we have to walk in it. Now, this brings us to the understanding of our, stand, our standing in Christ. Remember, standing in Christ. Because our standing in Christ identifies us to our place in Christ, which shows us our calling and our possessions that identifies us to our inheritance. We are children of God. That's what it shows us. But the fact that Christ is in us points to our source, being Christ, our purpose, our walk, and our potential. That's what it points to. So you have this here and you have this there. You have possession, inheritance here. You have uh, walk here. You have different things when Christ, because you're in Christ and Christ is in you. But I want to tell you, we may not get all these facts down, but he's all you need. He's complete. That's what you have to understand. He is all in all. There's no place you can go to get anything or add anything to your life. There's nothing in you that can be added into your life. You have Christ. That's what you've got to understand. We haven't really got that in us because Christianity or salvation is sort of a generic term. It's sort of out there. I remember it took a while for me to understand Yes, I'm saved. And it was sort of like, yeah, Christ did that for me. I did not understand that I am saved because I actually have eternal life in me. It's not something out there that's going to happen. I've got it right now. But in order to understand the abundant life, I have to walk it out. That's the difference. It's all there, but I have to walk it out. That, now, to understand this incredible grace offered us through redemption, because we've been placed in Christ because of grace, we have 
Christ in us because of grace, we must begin with the payment itself. The cost was death. Now we know that. So what's this cost? It's the payment of Christ's death as the Lamb of God on the cross. That's the payment. And passive faith allows us to know this is true. We just receive that as true. So we've been in place in Christ. We get this. This we know because of his word saying so. But we have to come to a point that that's not just all that happened. We weren't just placed in Christ. We were actually given his eternal life. And to ensure this abundance and this fruitfulness in us, guess what? It has to be worked in us and through us and out of us as through obedience through obedience mainly, submission and obedience. Now, Christ identified with our plight, right? So, he did it by dying for us. And we have to become identified in the place and way of righteousness by dying to the old life. Remember, he became sin for us so we could be what? Made in the righteousness of God. God. We're made in the righteousness of God. That means his life is being brought out. Yes, when God looks down, he sees Christ. He sees his righteousness. But that righteousness has to come out in our life through faith and obedience. That sounds simple enough, right? Really, it's not. It's a daily walk. Now, the Christian life was secured by Jesus' death. Okay? But we have to understand, to gain Christ, we have to die. The old life in us, the old way has to die. Now, Paul's going to bring this principle out in many different ways. So, let's just take the children of Israel up front. We all know about them. The old generation had to what? They had to die out before the new generation could enter the promised land. They had to die out. So like our self-life, the faith of the old generation of Israel proved to be fickle. Anytime you have the self-life of the world in your walk, you're gonna, your faith is going to prove to be fickle. It has to be complete, whole, and pure. It's all about God. And so if we have any part of the self-life in us, we're going to be fickle. Now, these people could not see how they could possess the promises, I'm talking about Israel, in their state. They say, how can we do that? Look, we have the, the giants against us. We have the uh, great cities and iron, uh, you know, uh, chariots against us. We have all these things against us. So how can we take them in our present state, in our strength. Well, they didn't understand. They couldn't. They'd have to trust God to strengthen them, to go before them, to fight the battle for them. And we're the same way. We cannot overcome the old man and all those things in our life and our old old own power. We have to submit to the power of God, which is the Holy Spirit, who works that in us. And then by childlike faith, we believe it. I love it, what Ronald Reagan said about people. When they said, you know, those, those young men, there, they think they can take on the world and do this and do that. And he says, don't tell them. Don't tell them they can't. And most likely, they will. You see, we tell people, you can't. That's too big for you. Well, in light of God, guess what? They're not big enough. And we're looking at the wrong thing. People are looking at the challenge and not at the possibilities. They're looking at what has to be, they think has to be accomplished, instead of recognizing it's already been accomplished. It's a matter of going out and claiming it. The people that are behind the great move we see today never said, I can't. They looked at it and said, what do I need to do? 
What do I need to do? And they said, well, you have to sacrifice. I'm willing to sacrifice. Well, you may have to give this up. I'm willing to give that up. What do we have to do? We look at circumstances and say, God, I can't do that. And God's going to say, you're right. And then you turn around and say, I can't do it. But in, in you, all things are possible. And if you ask me to do it, I can do it. You see, that's faith. Faith is willing to rest. Faith is willing to sacrifice. Why? To accomplish something that's greater than you. You cannot walk according to the present vision of this world. You will give up. You walk according to the vision of heaven itself. And that is bigger than you. And it has to be bigger than you. Because every time you look at your strength, you make everything bigger than you. It's only when you look at it through God does it become as small as it is in God's sight. The children of Israel looked at the circumstances. The old generation could not possess the promised land. We can't possess the life of Christ and the promise of it in our own strength. We have to lose confidence in our personal strength if we're going to discover the work of God in grace. If we're going to discover what it means to, to possess his wisdom, his righteousness, to have sanctification, to experience the fullness of redemption in our life. Now it's natural, I've done it, to try to control the narrative by trusting our strength. But the spiritual wilderness is great. The world is a spiritual wilderness. The enemies are powerful. We don't have the strength to endure the way. Because it's hard. And that's why Paul wisely begins with what? The demise of the old man, the old life. In a, in a way... He wrote the obituary of it in verse 3. He said, if you're in Christ, you have been baptized unto his death. That's the obituary of the old man. That total identification, he wrote it right there. Very simple. Well, Rayola, it doesn't sound so great. No, it's not meant to be great. Because what needs to be great in your life is Christ, not yourself, not the old man. We have been baptized into death as a simple obituary. You know what? It says the old is dead. Why are you holding on to it? Why are you looking back? Why are you walking according to it? It's dead, period. Put a marker on and say, you are dead, and thank God you're dead. You haven't done a thing for me. Except torment me, lie to me, destroy me. So what does it mean to be baptized into his death? Well, let's look at verse 4. I love this. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Notice the word buried. Wow. Now I want you to go out there right now if you're dead to self and dig up that decaying old self and see how it smells. You have been buried. It's all about burial. That's why the gospel is a death burial. Now he's getting into the significance of the burial here. You are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Now look at the promise. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. There you go. It's that simple. Not very easy to walk in, but it's that simple. He lays it out very carefully. By being baptized in the work of Christ's redemption, we have been baptized into his death. 
Everything about the old has been taken to the grave. It's in the grave. It's been buried. And all of it's doing is it's decaying and it's becoming a stench. Why go back to it? One of the things I ask the Lord is, do I have unresolved issues in my life? You know what unresolved issues in my life are? There's a, there are those strings that come out of the grave and they begin to pull me back to the old. Because you see, I want them resolved. They're not going to be resolved. If you have unresolved issues in your life, they're probably not going to be resolved. Let it go. It's just pulling you back to the old. It will torment you. Let it go. Say, Lord, whatever you have to do, separate me from that. Kill me from that. Bring me forth. But I don't want to be dragged back to that decaying mess. Because that's what it is. It's been buried. Has it not been buried? Did you know when you went to Christ and hey, forgive my sins. You've taken them to the cross in the first place. You died for them and you took them to the grave. They're buried. And then Satan comes along. Oh, but they're not. Well, Lord, those unresolved issues, they've been taken care of. Maybe I don't understand them. Maybe I don't have peace. But if I don't let go of them, I never will have peace. I will never have healing. I've got to let go. You're calling me into a new, exciting life. And it's a victorious life. It's an overcoming life. And I choose to believe that. That's what it comes down to. Now, it's no longer I that live. We talk about that. Paul talks about in Galatians 2.20. We quote that verse all the time. I have no strength, people. I have no means. I have no life to speak of in and of myself. I am dead. The old man has been silenced. The world has no lure on me any longer because the old man is dead. And you know what? I make sure he's dead by crucifying him every day. Sometimes minute by minute if he's really bugging me a lot. You know, I wish I could just punch him out. But he needs to be crucified. Look at Galatians 6.14 with me. When I read this, you know, you read the Bible through, but there's scriptures that don't stand, up to you, stand out to you. And then I, you come to these scriptures and you think, wow. 6.14. I come to this scripture a lot to remind myself of it. It says, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom, now note this, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. If I'm dead to the old man, the world has no means to lure me in because it, it attracts my lust. It takes my affections captive. If I'm dead, there's no means. In fact, I want you to know, a man can only discover real satisfying life when he is dead to this world's attractions and influences. He has nothing to lose. Therefore, he can live as a martyr, as a witness. As a martyr, he is ever ready to be offered up at all times, ready to leave an honorable testimony behind of a life gained because he was willing to lose the old. Now you can only gain Christ's life through identification in his death. I want you to think about this. I want you to meditate on it during this week if you can. I'm dead. What? in my life from the old still lives. What is it doing to my life in Christ because it still lives? How is it preventing me from really gaining that life that Christ has for me? 
Now, like Christ, your highest mission and mine, please hear me, your highest mission, your commission is to preach the gospel, but your highest mission is to die. To die in order to gain Christ. You do it for the sake of Christ. You do it because you love Christ. You do it because you want to gain Christ. You do it because he's worthy. That is your highest mission is to die. To this old man. You cease to be so the new life can come out of you. Now, to gain the life of Christ. I want you to know that when you die to the old, it's not a sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice. We think, oh, it's a sacrifice. No, it's not. It's not a sacrifice. You see, a sacrifice will cost you something that is worthy for God to consider. Your old life isn't worthy for God to consider. It's not a sacrifice. It's a necessity. What you do when you die to the old man is you do an exchange. I mean to the old man. You do the exchange. You die to the old to gain the new. It's the exchange. I exchange the old life, ugh, that sick life, to gain the life of Christ. Because you can't have both. They're contrary to one another. And that's what Paul's trying to, uh, in, in, most, in many of his apostles, he's trying to get across to us. And it's, it's hard to think about when you haven't been conditioned to think about it. The old must cease, and therefore now to the cross is a necessity, people. If we are to walk the narrow path to righteousness, it's a necessity. It's not a sacrifice, but an exchange. Now, the old is buried in order for the new to raise up. Paul is saying, if you are buried with him, Jesus, by baptism into death, then guess what? You and I will be raised with Christ in a new life. That's what he's promising. That's how we gain it. Now, remember, there has to be death to the old before there can be resurrection of the new. We can't be identified with Christ in the new life unless we are identified in his death. Now, death is the old, death to the old, in order to raise the newness. I want you to think about that. It's a glorious identification. You're no longer identified to a doomed world, to a profane, pathetic life. Now you're identified to something that is heavenly and eternal and worthwhile. That's what you're identified to. So what do you want, right? Now, death to the old in order for the new to raise is a complete identification to the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's the identification to the work of redemption. You have been bought. It is something that we must believe it is so. It's done. It's not a matter, oh, well, I, I wish it was done. Oh, I don't feel it's done. You know what? I can just feel my crummy self. I have seen my crummy self. Hey, it's not how you feel. It's what you believe. Do you believe that in Christ you have been baptized unto his death. The old is dead. Now you might have to bury it. You may have to crucify it. But guess what? It's dead. Period. And you have to believe it. It's not how you feel. It's not how you think. It's what Christ has told you in his word. It's the hope that you have in him. You're banking not only eternity on it, but you're banking on getting through this world and being able to walk in glory and not be held back by any old. And not be feel ashamed because you tried, you couldn't get, you, you did get rid of it and you couldn't bring it and offer it to Christ. Remember, you're going to offer something to Christ. What's it going to be? His life or yours? We have to consider that. 
So it doesn't matter if you don't believe that if you don't feel it, you need to believe it's so. What does it mean to walk in a new life? We believe what the Bible says about this life. I believe what it says. I know I'm human. I can't stand myself half the day. Okay, sometimes. But you know what? At the end, I say, you know what, Lord? I'm dead. I wish I... I'm dead. So your life can be raised up in me. And yes, this is the old trying to raise his head. Yes, this is the pride. Yes, I know all about it. But I know your Bible says, because I have been born again, because I'm identified in your gospel, I am dead. And you're still working that life in me. You're not finished with me. He's not finished with us until we enter glory. Now, it is a disciplined life of the disciple. That's the, that's the thing here. He's calling us to a disciplined life of a disciple. It's a life that bears a cross, walks up a narrow path, while the old is crucified daily, so that the person can live afresh the life of Christ. Now, transform transformation never takes place overnight. Now, translation from the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light is immediate. However, transformation, it is a process. How do we know it? Because of the butterfly. The butterfly never begins in this base, original state. In other words, it starts as a what? A caterpillar bound to the earth, crawling in the dust. Most people don't appreciate it. There's no attraction to it. There's no beauty to it. And yet it's very important to let that caterpillar live because it's going to come to a stage where it can do nothing more than die. And before it dies, and ceases to be, it prepares its own cocoon. But something miraculously happens in that cocoon. We don't see it with the naked eye. We can't even imagine. They haven't even really been able to explain it, the scientists. It is a mystery. Remember that it's a mystery. It's done something, it's done in a hidden grave. The cocoon is a type of grave, it's a type of burial for this caterpillar. But this transformation takes place. Oh, what a transformation. And then pretty soon, this beautiful creature breaks out. Yeah, it takes a little bit for it to break out. It has to eat its way out from what I understand. And it breaks out. This creature that comes forth is no longer earthbound. It possesses such a beauty at times it can take your breath away. I want you to think about that. Above all else, it has reached its potential in high calling. You know why we know? Because now it flies. That's transformation. You see, we're that caterpillar with our basic nature. We're crawling on the ground. We're eating dust. People would rather step on us, not consider us at all. But we have this experience with Christ, and we say, you know what? I don't have to be a caterpillar. He's called me to be something greater. But I have to go into what? my cocoon. I have to be identified with him and his burial. And then as the process begins inwardly in us, and it's an inward process you can't see, I can't see, but the Lord tells us it's happening. That inward process is, be, is being done by the Holy Spirit. It's transformation. And he's changing us inwardly. And we think, oh man, what a process. 
I don't see any change. Do you think that caterpillar really understood the change that was going on? Could he see the change going on? And then pretty soon, one day, something happens. We begin to break forth. It starts to part. It starts to part. And we're brought forth in a new life. We have the potential now and the means to reach our highest calling. So what is that calling? Well, people, the purpose is to bring glory to God. It's not our work. Yes, we choose to be identified with Christ in that cocoon, that type of death. It's God's work that brings us to our high calling, our purpose. This, my friend, is grace. It's all about grace. We, not, we must not allow ourselves to be bound to this earth by the old, such as fear, insecurities, worldliness, idolatry, pride, compromise. We could go on and on and on. <clears throat> the life of Christ is as in us is pure. Please hear me. The life of Christ in us is pure. And any wrong mixtures that involves personal strength, practices and agreements with the world, will not only cause us to remain earthbound in the spiritual wilderness of the world, but we will never become that transformed butterfly whose beauty not only speaks of reaching its ultimate heights and potential, but unveils the magnificent work of the Creator. Causing us to fly, to soar, to be this beautiful reflection of Christ, bringing him glory. That's what it's all about. And it can't happen until we first die to the old. <clears throat>